Hi guys, I'm absolutely honoured to be sitting here with the man himself, Tom Furness, the grandfather of VR, someone who's got over 50 years experience in the virtual reality industry. I kind of feel like I'm sitting here with Obi-Wan Kenobi. Um, <laughs> Tom, it's an absolute honour to, uh, it's an honour to have you here. Thank you so, so much for giving up your time to come uh, to chat with, uh, with the audience uh, and to tell us a little bit about your career and your background and, uh, and the work that you've been doing in, well, since before I was born. <laughs> and it's a delight to be here. So we're going to start, Tom, just quickly. Um, I'm going to just quickly go past some of the housekeeping slides. So um, I think okay. most people have, have already either muted or you muted yourself. Please do feel free to take photos during the session. If you're on a VR headset, you can pull up your tablet using the button on your left controller and you'll find the camera icon on the right hand side. You'll then be able to hold up your tablet and take the pictures. These will say to the folder on your desktop. If you are on a PC, you're on a non, uh, non-headset mode, you can click the escape key and you can still access photos. You just need to kind of line them up before you take them. So, Tom, we're going to start today just by chatting a, a little bit about your history and and some of the early projects that you were involved with and, and your your career and your, your work with with a virtual reality with headsets. It really started in in the sixties in the air in, in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Okay, Tom. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Well, before we start that, I would like to uh, uh, actually, Steve, when we had our trial session, uh, when was that? Uh, two days ago. Yeah. Um, our dry run. Um, uh, Steve asked me, you know, is this the sort of the first time I've been in this kind of virtual environment? And I told him that, uh, well, yes, it, it is. This is the first time I've been in this kind of uh, interactive virtual environment. Then I had to stop and think. And I said, well, no, it isn't. Because in 1994, we did a project uh, with um, funded by um, funded by Fujitsu and uh, U.S. West Communications, where we set up a project we call Green Space. And in Green Space, we had two people in Seattle and two people in Japan who were interacting in real time in a virtual world, where we would see their real faces. Um, and uh, they were animated by our speeches, uh, by what we were saying. And we had um, two uh, silicon graphics onyx machines, one in Tokyo, one in Seattle. And we all had headsets on. We had data gloves on. And um, what happened is that we would um, send our gestures to Japan to animate our faces there. They would send their their animations uh, and speech, of course, ours here, and then we would sit in this virtual space. Now, when we were in Seattle, we sat down in this space, and we're in a Japanese cottage. We look mm -hmm. out the window, and we see Mount Fuji. But when they put on their headset, they were transported to a log cabin, and they looked out their window, and, and with a fire in a fireplace, and they looked out their window, and they saw Mount Rainier. <laughs> Even though we had a common space, but we also were in a different world, each of us. And so then what we did, I had a, a colleague from um, Seattle across from me, and I had two colleagues from Japan here. And then what we did is played a game. And we had these these intelligent entities that oozed out of the table, and then the four of us had to navigate those entities into the corners. And we did this uh, over a four-day period in 1994. And uh, we had four ISDN dial-up lines between here and, um, and Tokyo. And we ran up a, well, it cost us about a million dollars to do this. <laughs> and uh, and uh, a $35,000 phone bill to do this over <laughs> four days. So we did that in 1994, November. So, so what, this is different. What, what, was the, what was the hardware, Tom? What, what, what was what was the headsets uh, equivalent that you were using then? Well, we were using the VR4 headsets. 
uh, and it had uh, a reasonable field of view, not as wide a field of view, as, of course, as the, as the Vive I'm wearing today. And we had a Palamus tracking system, electromagnetic tracking, which is one of the systems that I developed in the Air Force many years ago. And so we also were instrumenting our hands, uh, uh, positions of our hands in six degrees of freedom as we were interacting with everybody else. Yeah. That's crazy to think that you were doing that <laughs> so so long ago. Uh, you, you mentioned the Air Force, and, and obviously that is, that's where I was heading uh, to start with. And, and you sent me across these three wonderful pictures yeah. of three different headsets uh, from mm-hmm. different points yeah, earlier earlier on in your right. career through the sixties into the eighties. Do you want to just do you want to just talk us through sure. what we're seeing here from from the you bet. the sixty seven to sixty nine to eighty one? You bet. So my job uh, it, um, once I graduated graduated from Duke University in electrical engineering, I uh, received a commission in the Air Force as a second lieutenant. Uh, this was during the Vietnam War period, and uh, I was going to go to the war. But as it turns out, I was sent to Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and my assignment was basically to develop advanced cockpits for fighter airplanes. And there were some real problems at that time. Uh, we were, of course, concerned about flying at night. How do you you be able to navigate uh, those conditions? How you be able to see the bad guys and 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 do that kind of thing? And it was clear that our, con- our traditional cockpits were not, were not going to get us there. We had some real limitations. And so uh, the pilots were concentrating on instruments in the cockpit when, in fact, they needed to be concentrating on what's going on outside. And so the, my job was to solve some problems, some difficult problems. So it was clear to me that we're not going to get there just by putting more instruments in the cockpit. We already had uh, 300 switches and 75 displays and 11 switches on the control stick and nine switches on the throttle. We had very limited space on the displays we could put there. So I started working on basically using virtual interfaces. And you see on the top um, left here, I think I can put this, can I? Yeah. Um, so, 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 Tom, I'm doing it behind you. So the one on the left, yeah. Right, there we go. The top left, this was the first helmet-mounted display. And it has a miniature cathode ray tube located on the right-hand side of the helmet. Miniature television picture tube, about a one-inch in, di- one inch in diameter. And uh, about 16 kilovolts sitting on the side of your helmet to accelerate that electron beam. So a picture is scanned on that and is relayed by optics, magnified, collimated into one eye of the pilot. And that's Lieutenant Furness wearing that very first head-mounted display. And then what happens is you get a 30-degree picture at optical infinity that moves around as you move your head. And this gave us the ability to put a big screen in the cockpit that we wouldn't be able to get otherwise by using this virtual projection. But then we decided, well, there's another problem, too, and that's how do you aim things. And so you see in the second picture, um, the... Um, uh, my, my helmet mounted sight. The helmet sighting system is where we actually took, um, uh, a helmet, a, a traditional Air Force helmet, and we plugged on the top of it this, uh, contraption that had a reticle projector, uh, where we took, um, uh, just project reticle in optical infinity. So as you move your head, that reticle moves around in space. And we had two lead sulfide photodiodes on each side of the helmet. We scanned that with, uh, infrared flop. And then projected a line through them, a vector, and resolved that vector in the azimuth and elevation angles. So we knew exactly where the head was pointing. And oh, by the way, this is the same system that Vive is using today. And this is 1967. <laughs> this is sort of a reincarnation of that principle. Okay, so now we know the head position. Is, is, is that you as well there, Tom? That is, that that's Lieutenant Furness. That's Lieutenant Furness wearing the very first helmet style system. You don't look okay. quite as much like like the dark side as you do in that first picture there. Ah, uh, yeah. You're look, looking quite <laughs> sinister. <laughs> uh, sinister. <laughs> well, then, of course, the thing was that we said, okay, well, if we actually combine these two, the head tracking system with the head display, now we know where this picture is located all the time. So as we move yeah. that around, uh, we're able to track that, and then we could call up information depending upon where you're looking. And, oh, by the way, we could aim sensors on the aircraft 
like low light level television, forward looking infrared. So now it's like looking through the cockpit at night and seeing the world as if the cockpit weren't there. So um, we combine these two in uh, various displays where you're projecting the visor. It's just the visor is a paraboloid and it becomes the basically the optical component. So you don't even know you have a display on until you switch it on, and then you see it, uh, these images of optical infinity. And we went through many, many incarnations of that until um, we finally decided that, well, actually, we can build a virtual cockpit, a cockpit that you wear, where we yeah. take all of the instrumentation, we organize it and portray it in this, this fusion of information, a circumambience. It's all 3D, and it's overlaid over the world. When you're flying in daytime, you see through it. It's like an augmented reality display. Uh, when uh, at night, it replaces the world. And so it becomes, um, you know, it, it basically takes over and gives you a picture of that world that you wouldn't see otherwise. And in order to simulate that, we built our Darth Vader helmet. You see the Darth Vader helmet there on the uh uh, I don't think that's me is wearing that helmet, but uh, the Darth Vader helmet now gives us a hundred degree field of view. That's more field of view than I have in my Vive right now. Yeah, one hundred twenty degree field of view by eighty degree field of view, uh, all in, in stereo. The, the center part of forty degrees is in stereo, and then we use a sixteen bit tracking system, which is actually more accurate than what I'm using right now. Electromagnetic tracking system. We had eye tracking in it. We had speech input, binaural sound, all of this in uh, in the uh, late, uh, early, early 80s. And uh, this was all hooked up to um, um, eight VAX computers uh, with a shared multiport memory that we built. We had two evidence settled in picture systems, one to draw the left eye, one to draw the right eye. The helmet itself cost a one million dollars a pop, wow. and uh, the whole system was probably about uh, fifteen million. And um, so I ended up spending, you know, uh, you know, over a hundred million uh, of taxpayers' money <laughs> developing these new, uh, these uh, fairly advanced systems. Uh, so in it's interesting, Tom. You, you, you've talked, you've said a, a couple of times you referred to them as systems, and you made reference particularly to the to the second headset as being kind of more like augmented reality. So, I mean, the, these headsets these, these predate, predated that terminology, didn't they? So it did. What, what we were never... you referring to, like when you when, when you were trying to explain, like I want to build this to somebody, mm -hmm. you didn't have, you couldn't just go, I'm going to build a virtual reality headset. You know, you know that AR stuff. Let's make something that uses AR. So, if you didn't have that terminology, did you? Was it a case of you had to rely on the engineering terminology to to explain what you were trying to do? Well, we did have a collective term for it. We called them visually coupled systems, and so okay. uh, we. There actually, the term virtual reality did not come into being until um, Jaron Lanier hatched the Jaren, term later yeah. on. That's Jaron many years later. And then we just started yeah. using that term, but uh, it was clear that we're using virtual images and uh, that uh, those virtual images allowed us to mani manipulate things that we wouldn't be able to do with real images because of the limitations in physical space. Right. And so uh, we never did. We always considered it a spectrum. One of the systems we had was the variable transmission visor. So basically we could change how much transmittance of outside light came in as a function of a dial setting or how much luminous was coming in from the outside world. So it was a continuum, continuum all the way from uh, augmented reality through to virtual reality. So we never did differentiate the, the two. Okay. We saw them as being part of the same thing. Yeah. So, now, so in a, in a, yeah. But it was no, clear sorry, to us on. that, go ahead. No, 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 you go. I was, I was going to move on to the next topic, but go. Well, the, the thing to remember was also that the, um, there's more to it than just the visual part. And that's mm -hmm. when we started getting to the super cockpit. The super cockpit is the cockpit that you wear. And what you get from that is not only, uh, your visual input, which is amazing in terms of the field of view, and it's an augmented reality and virtual reality all wrapped into one, but you had this, uh, representation of acoustic information. 
and tactile information. And we had actually tactors. We had gloves that were tracking with tactors in those gloves. So you can reach out into the cockpit. When you reach out in a particular part of the cockpit, a switch panel would window in. Then you reach out and touch a switch that wasn't really there, but appeared to be there. And you got the tactor that you'd actually touched it. And you switch that uh, particular function, take your hand away, and the switch panel disappears. It's not like it's not there anymore. It doesn't block the, the outside, doesn't block your view of the world. So uh, in the binaural sound, we had all kinds of ways of representing information to the pilots. For example, uh, we were looking for what we call audio icons or ear cons. These are like visual icons, only they're ear cons. They're particular sounds that we used. And one of the problems was how do you get the pilot's attention when they are really busy? And this is a difficult because pretty much we're time division multiplexing in our brain. And uh, so we have our senses here. We're, we're concentrating on some and not on others. And often when you're in the heat of the battle, you don't even hear anything. Even all these warning sounds are, are going on uh, with the master caution panel in the aircraft. So we had to figure out a way how to get the pilot's attention. And it was clear that traditional methods of using these ear cons didn't work. Well, some of the ear cons, by the way, was uh, when we usually had a problem with what we call bingo fuel. This is when you're running out of fuel in the aircraft. What would happen is uh, this voice would come on and say, bingo fuel, bingo fuel. And any time you use language, it's very difficult to process that. I mean, it's, it takes a lot more bandwidth than if you had one of these ear cons. So we found that one of the best ways to represent bingo fuel is when you heard a sound. It sounded like this, sort of the bottom of a milkshake. Yeah. Like, you know, when, you're, when you do a milkshake and you suck the bottom out, that means you're running out of fuel. And we use various other, we had you use rattlesnakes, we use all kinds of other things to, to depict this. But still, in many cases, uh, because of the, the limited bandwidth processing capacity of the human, we had to resort to other means. And there's a thing that, uh, I didn't mean to get off on this, but this is sort of, sort of cool stuff. Um, uh, uh, one of the things as we as humans have is what is called a sacred space. This is a, an area around us. This is our yeah. space, our personal space. And the Helmholtz even wrote about this. And, um, when you are generally outside, when somebody's outside your sacred space and you're, uh, they're communicating with you or talking to you, you can be a million miles away in your head, uh, thinking about something else. But when they enter your sacred space and get into this personal space, you cannot ignore them. And, um, and so we decided, how can we do this to get attention when we, um, um, when these pilots are in the middle of a battle? So what would happen is we had a simulation where we, uh, you're flying along and you had a fire in an engine, an engine fire. And normally a master caution light would come on on the panel. You probably wouldn't even see it. You hear a, a horn or a bell or a whistle going off in your headset. You'd ignore that. But, what we did was there's a little voice that came with binaural sound up to your ear and whispered in your ear and said, Daddy, I ha you have a fire in your right engine. And it is so compelling. It's your daughter's voice, your own daughter's voice. You almost can feel the breath on her ear, on your ear. And it gets you completely out of what you're doing and paying attention. I have a fire in an engine. I've got to pay attention to that right now. So these were some of the things we were doing with these uh, systems uh, for 23 years. I worked on these Vance cockpits, and we right. were working on all kinds of the the uh, hardware technology, software technology to get it to happen. But remember, this is working for the Department of Defense, and we had uh, a lot more money than we do as academics. And um, so um, that was some of the old days. Oh, um, right. absolutely, absolutely amazing, Tom. I, I'm, I mean, quick show of hands from the audience. Who's already convinced that Tom's actually come back in time from the future? <laughs> because the, you're talking, you, you talk so casually about stuff that, like, you know, will get tweeted these days. Like, oh, look at this amazing new thing that might come out in five years' time. 
and you were doing it 30 years ago <laughs> fair enough you had hundreds of millions of dollars but um <laughs> but um absolutely amazing but you, you went from you went from the air force to the university of washington yes where you founded yes. the, the hit lab the human interface mm -hmm. technology lab research and, and was reading about the the projects that you've um you've uh, put together at the at the hit lab the stuff that really interested me and i know um i don't know if he's actually in his avatar at the moment because he's live at the uh the virtual medicine conference but i know that chris madison is mm -hmm. really interested in this as well yes. but, um this idea of virtual reality therapy and, you, and you've, you've worked with burn victims and people mm -hmm. people with arachnophobia um mm -hmm. that so you, you, you kind of you you took your engineering work and you 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 brought it together with almost the site the the psychological side of of, uh, of virtual reality, haven't you? Well, yes, but it didn't happen. Be, uh, it it wasn't because I was particularly brilliant <laughs> in foreseeing these things. Um, when I did, let me let me explain the reason why I, I moved from the world of uh, military R and D to the university. Um, the um, as it turns out. Um, uh, there was a an event that happened. I was asked to do a press conference for the government um, of my, the work I was doing at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and I I end up on CBS Evening News um, with Dan Rather's crowd, David Martin, the Pentagon correspondent. They come into my lab. They spend two days taping over. Uh, 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 videotaping some of the things that we've been doing. I had to declassify a bunch of stuff to do that, but nevertheless, they were there. So I end up on the CBS Evening News, and this is in about 1986 time period. And what happened as a result of that is I started getting phone calls from uh, people around the country. This called me and said, I saw this program on television and uh, I wondered if you could help me. My child has cerebral palsy. Is there anything you can do with that technology to help my child? And then a, a surgeon called me. He says, I'm a thoracic surgeon. I'm inside this patient up to my elbows doing a graft of the aorta. And my map tells me where to go is a, a CT scan. It's on a light box on the wall over to the side. And I'm always looking over to there to try to figure out where my hands are. Isn't there any way that you can put me sort of inside uh, to where or see through the patient so I can see these things? Then another surgeon says, I'm, I'm uh, want to do a minimally invasive surgical procedure where I want my eyes to be inside looking out rather than outside looking in. Can you put my eyes inside the patient? Makes then sense. a firefighting company uh, uh uh, called me and said, you know, we have this real problem with firefighters. They go into these buildings. They're filled with smoke. They don't know if there are any people in the building. They don't even know where the fire is. And, um, and they are, uh, they don't know where the other firefighters are in the building. And the fire chief who's trying to direct all of this on the outside of the building with a radio and he doesn't know anything. And so there's this real problem. How do you coordinate a firefighter? Is there any way that you can give us a ability to see through the smoke, walk in these buildings and know what the layout is, the building, things like that? So I was getting three or four phone calls a week from people who had watched these programs on television. And, uh, and uh, my answer to their question is, well, yeah, you could do that. Something really big. We're on something that could be transformative. It was a whole new medium. It was a way to move our minds. And we'd found out from that Darth Vader helmet that you saw, 120 degrees helmet, something magic happens when you go immersive. For example, uh, we did a study where we started off, well, we wanted to find out the effects of field of view. So we started off with, um, we had this 120 degree window, but we started off and electronically masked it down to 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees, 60 degrees, all the way out to 120 degrees. And it was interesting that while you were less than 60, 80 degrees, it, it was like you were looking at a picture that was head stabilized. Okay. It moved around as you move your head. But when you went beyond 80 degrees, it was like a switch went off in your head. Bang. Now all of a sudden it's like somebody had reached out of the picture and pulled you inside.
Now you are not looking at a picture. You're in a place. And you didn't realize you were even sitting in the cockpit anymore. You are now in this other place. Just like me now. I, uh, and you've seen this before. When you take your headset off and all of a sudden you're in this other place and that's not possible because you're just sitting here in Mars and now all of a sudden you're in this, this, uh, rat lab room, conference room. So this sense of place really does is transformative because VR puts a place inside of us by putting us in a place and you never forget places. And that's, it awakens a spatial memory. And that's what became really important, um, in our, in our future work. But anyhow, as a result of all of this, uh, I realized I needed to get this out of the Air Force. I needed to get it out of the military to where we could do some real good with it. And, um, so I shopped out around a plan to set up a laboratory somewhere, uh, associated with the university, perhaps because taxpayers paid a lot of money for my education. And, uh, this need to be con- conveyed to students so that they can carry it, carry on with the work. And so, uh, I ended up at University of Washington with an offer. I remember I lived in Dayton, Ohio. When I moved to Seattle, it was like, the heaven. You know, and so, uh, so that's where I started the hit lab. And now there's another hit lab in New Zealand, another one in Australia. Um, but, uh, and we've spun off 27 companies, uh, two of them are trading on NASDAQ and a market capitalization of about $12 billion and, uh, wow. continuing to build the technology as we go along to help fuel the industry. And most of the major companies, uh, pretty much are using uh, some part of our technology and our students. Well, back to the uh, what happened in terms of moving to Seattle. It was clear that at that time in 1989, no one still knew what virtual reality was. And there are a few people, right? The, the technology yeah. geeks and things like that and knew what it was. But um, I decided, well, let's get a product out there, the very first VR consumer product. And I... Uh, uh, Produced a patent for a personal eyewear display that would basically give you um, a, a theater on your head. You'd have a virtual image that's subtended about one meter that would be located about three meters away. It's like a home theater system. And um, this would be a plug into a, uh, uh, a belt of uh, um, electronics that had a battery pack in it and a television receiver. So you could walk around. And you could see this, uh, this, uh, so I don't know if I put those slides in there. Do you remember if I did that? Uh, no, I don't have I that much. No. I don't think so. But anyhow, uh, this was going to be, um, our first entree into the VR space from a consumer standpoint. Yeah. So we took it to the consumer electronic show. People were lined up for two hours saying, Oh gosh, this is fantastic. Uh, you guys are going to make a fortune with this. Um, and, uh, we thought, Wow, we're going to make a fortune with this. <laughs> so we ramped up these things. And, uh, mind you, it was a little, a little clunky. Uh, the technology was, uh, not too far along at that time. Um, and this was just a display. It wasn't a tracking system or anything. And, um, and, uh, so people lined up to, to, uh, to see this. And then when we opened it in the first store in Seattle, people were also lined up there to see it. It had been in the news and everything. And then they looked at the price tag. Mm. It was going to cost seven hundred and ninety nine dollars. Um, in nineteen eighty nine. Nineteen. Oh, this no. This was now about ninety four. Okay. And um, ninety five. Still. Yeah. And so it was pretty expensive, and people said, yeah. "You know, it, I'd like to have this, but it's just too expensive." Uh, and if all I can do is watch Oprah, you know, that's not going to be uh, uh, too uh, too gratifying. But. Um, so, but what happened was interesting. We we noticed that uh, there was a, a, a market segment that started buying these things like crazy. Um, these were dentists. Okay. Dentists, uh, we said, why would dentists want this? And we went to talk to some of these dentists, and we saw what they were doing. And they were basically putting these headsets onto their patients. And the patients would pick out a movie they want to watch. And so the, the uh, uh, what happens is the... Um, 
dentists are uh, are entertaining the or the movies are entertaining the patients while the dentists inflict pain on them. And yeah. uh, and he said that uh, they said that the uh, the patients this is wonderful. I mean, the patients don't complain anymore. I mean, I'm able to get on with my work, and they're really entertained. But it is causing another problem. Now we can't get them to leave. Uh, I said I can't leave now. This is a, this is the good part. The movie that they're watching. <laughs> so, um, but even more remarkable than that is what was happening with the little kids. Um, uh, because what we do, what they were doing is hooking up a Nintendo. So here they were and Nintendo in virtual space mm-hmm. and they were playing with the uh, controllers with their hands. And, uh, now these little kids had been to the dentist. I kept asking their mothers, when can we go back to the dentist back again? Back to the dentist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we can play that. <laughs> and so when did that ever happen? When did a kid ever want to go to the dentist? So this was, um, this told us there was something really going on there. And especially that the dentist said they don't seem to notice the pain. And there's a little bit of pain. Um, and so we went over to the children's hospital and we did the same thing with them. The children's hospital, Seattle Children's Hospital, where patients, these little patients have leukemia. And uh, what happens in order to, to measure the efficacy of the chemotherapy, you have to take bone marrow samples. And you do that by putting a needle in the hip and yeah. uh, extracting bone marrow. And it is really painful. Very painful. Uh, because you can't anesthetize these kids. And um, so normally the kids would scream. It's so painful. Uh, but you put the headset on, they're playing Nintendo, kids are bent over, sticking the needle, the kid just makes, says, uh, and keeps going. And uh, the doctors Damn. and the nurses are looking around at each other and saying, what is going on here? And then that got us into burn pain. And we went to the burn clinic, to Harborview Burn Center, and we started working with patients who have um burn pain which is uh these are severely burned people and you can control their burn pain when they're resting what is called resting pain with opioids and uh morphine and things like that but the problem is those are bad the nasty stuff uh they uh it's it's toxic it's addictive and uh when you go in for wound care off the dead skin or uh, physical therapy, the pain shoots right through the roof. It goes through the morphine. You can't dose this patient with enough morphine and they remain conscious um, uh, that pain would go through. So what we did was started working with these patients. You put on the headset um, and they would be in a virtual world like you see this picture with the snowman. Where the, uh, where the snowmen are throwing snowballs at you and you're throwing snowballs back at them. And while you're doing this, um, um, this wound care is going. The, um, finish the procedure. And they didn't realize it. So what this tells you is the pain is really powerful. I mean, we decide what we're going to pay attention to. Experience pain, you have to pay attention to pain. And so this is this is also means lots of things for flow state. If we want to get um, our learners into flow states, we can put them in VR, and therefore you have this intense concentration removal of this, and yes. we uh, and the and learn to seven times faster. I mean, I had, uh, I found out early on that universities are bureaucracies <laughs> and, and uh, I couldn't move fast enough. And, yeah. um, and, also, and, they, and, uh, and also, I couldn't hire the people I wanted to hire. I mean, right. uh, some of the most brilliant people I've worked with are, are ones that may be unhirable, high school dropouts, things like yeah. that. They're brilliant. Yeah. So, um, um, the rock in the lab where to hire school kids, I could hire, um, uh, hire, uh, um, whomever, and, and I uh, call to the wall. Uh, it's a residential business. This house. It was 
my sort of my garage shop operation. And, uh, we've done some amazing things in there. For example, we have, uh, built, um, uh, virtual cockpits for Bell Helicopter. Bell Helicopter, uh, for their search and rescue helicopters, we did a, a project with them. And one of the bedrooms in the house, we turned into a, a helicopter simulator. And uh-huh. then we were doing things with heart rate games. We were coming up with ways to keep people entertained while they're exercising um, to deal with type 2 diabetes. And um, uh, and we could the, one of the bedrooms we set up for that. And um, so those are some of the kinds of projects we worked on. We worked on a, a new way of diagnosing heart disease, um, uh, uh, early warning system for cardiovascular disease, and and you know just whatever that uh, that um, I wanted to work on. So it gave me a lot of freedom, and uh, we could do some things fast. Which which leads yep. us nicely to the the VWS, the Virtual World Society, yes. which you founded. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, a lot of the projects, on, on almost all of the projects you're talking about there for both the Hit Lab and the Rat Lab, they're, they're of a very altruistic nature. Um, uh, and this is how we originally connected when I joined the the, the Virtual World mm-hmm. Society about just over a year ago. Um, I, I, mm-hmm. I can't remember how I came across it, but I instantly... Um, I knew that this was something that I wanted to be part of. I knew that this was something that was was in line with what I was trying to do in terms of just trying to, to give back to the education community. Mm-hmm. Um, so do you want to just explain to, to those that aren't familiar with the, the Virtual World Society, Tom, about how this came about and about the, the, the kind of aims and, and ambitions of, of the society? You bet. By the way, how many of you are members of the Virtual World Society? Okay. Well, hopefully, after this, all of you <laughs> will be members. So, um, I actually, um, uh, we were we were um, going along pretty well with the research we were doing in the in the hit lab in the mid nineties, and then a movie appears. Uh, I was contacted by the um, the producer and director of Lawnmower Man. I don't know if you guys remember oh, yeah. that movie, Lawnmower Man. And uh, they sent me a script and said, could you advise us on this movie? Because it had VR in it, right? And yeah. um, I was looking at the script and I said, oh, gosh, this is dystopian. You know, yeah. this is putting VR, which is going to have massive exposure through, in theaters in this movie. This is putting VR in a light, which I don't like. You know, it's a dark light. It's a, and it's, you know, this is my baby. We can do so much good with this. And here we are uh, taking it in that direction. So at that time, I said, we need something organized that will take the place of this negative side that's going to be presented uh, in the theater. As I started the first Virtual World Society in the 95, 96 time period, had about uh, 100 kids that were involved in it with the whole idea that we wanted to explore how VR can be used for good, especially starting with young people and how they could see this. Because we'd already, by that time, had a number of young people starting in 1991 build Virtual Worlds. And uh, we knew what they could do. It was amazing. And so I wanted to promote that and get that out in the world. But it was clear to me, I mean, our hardware cost 500 grand, uh, you know, for a, a silicon graphics machine and, and nobody really knew about VR. So we're way too early, even we had a 501c3 nonprofit doing that. So I decided, well, let's put this on a shelf for a while, waiting for the technology to catch up. And so, um, I look at it again in 2006. And then again in 2011, and uh, it was clear that even then, we still did not have enough um, uh, uh, technology, and there's not an installed base there. Well, and when uh, we, I finally saw the Oculus Rift show up, and uh, this is old stuff. I mean, we were doing the Oculus Rift, you know, many, many years before, equivalent to Oculus Rift. Um, I decided, you know, maybe it'll happen this time because now we have computational technology. We have screen technology that we never had before. And the price is way down. Yeah. And the bandwidth. Bandwidth, all those things. And so it's like the planet's got aligned, right? In order for this to really happen, VR to finally 
happen. All these dreams that we've had over the years can actually finally happen. And I decided, you know, this is the time to reactivate the virtual world society to lift mankind. The whole idea is to unlock and link minds and for humanitarian applications of the technology, which is where I, it should be with education and medicine and training and, and dealing with uh, these huge pervasive problems that we have in our world to link our minds together. So I started the virtual world society again. And, um, it's a 501c3 with the idea is that we want to move minds to new worlds and these worlds where we can work together to solve problems. And, um, the organization now has 1200 members. Um, we are doing some amazing things in, in terms of working with, with uh, refugees, working with uh, people in, in Chicago, with schools, with medicine, medis- medical applications, um, and trying to bring communities together. Cooperate on a lot of the humanitarian things. So, uh, the Virtual World Society is, is open for business. Uh, we have an amazing set of, um, of, um, uh, uh, board members and other participants. Uh, we do this Nexton prize. We have this, what we call the Nexton, N-E-X-T-A-N-T. The Nexton means the next sextant. It's our navigation system for the future our next sextant and the next award is given to um our next prize is given to people who are using the technology developing using the technology for good and so we recognize that at awe uh, every year now uh, this will be our fourth year coming up where we're awarding the next prize we're doing four actually awarding four next prizes this year so the virtual world society is um is growing we're hoping that it will be the peace core of vr the National Geographic of VR and the PBS of VR, uh, to where we get the, the goodness that can come from this out in the world. I am not confident that the industry itself is going to regulate itself. Let me tell you another little, a little story. Um, so I was uh, at a conference in, in San Francisco a few years ago, but two or three years ago. And um, uh, I was giving a fireside chat, fireside chat with uh, about a thousand people. <laughs> I was sitting on the stage and <laughs> like a fire, being interviewed, and and um, and I was talking about the similar things that we we are today. And then, but after I left, uh, after it was over, this guy comes running up to me from a company um, that I won't, won't mention that particular company. But anyhow, uh, it, it, we, he said we have some new stuff we want to show you. He's really excited. And so uh, would you come into our sort of our private suite and look at this? So I did. I went into this uh, this place. They had, new, they had some new controllers, a really well-designed headset, um, ergonomically pleasing, things like that. And um, he said, we want to show you this this new uh, app we have with our for show off our new equipment. I said, okay. He said, okay, here's the deal. You are uh, going to be in a getaway car. And uh, you're going to the police are going to be chasing you. You've just robbed a bank and uh, the police are going to be flying and driving by and things like that. And they're going to be shooting at you and you go shoot at them. And um, and you have an Uzi in your lap and a clip and you reach out and get the clips and put them in the Uzi. And then you shoot these policemen and uh, as they're coming by and you're getting trying to get away from them. And anyhow, they start to start this thing. And sure enough, <laughs> it was really good. You know, the quality was fantastic, actually. And uh, uh, and it was realistic. I mean, I see bullet holes going through the uh, glass and I um, have this Uzi and and, uh, you know, all this stuff going on and uh, blood and guts all over the place. You know, blowing people away. And then after it finished. Um, these guys said, well, what do you think? Wasn't that really neat? And I said, you know, come on, guys. Can't we do better than this? Just think of all the good we could do with this. Why are you showing this, practicing killing? And he says, well, that's what sells. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, it isn't what sells. The reason, well, he said, well, kids like this. And I said, you know, we have to understand that the games that the kids play are built by adults. And if you give kids the opportunity to build their own worlds, there's none of that stuff in it. Because I know 
He'd done it with hundreds, thousands of kids where they built their own worlds. And I said, this is the problem. We're stuffing this violence down their throat um, because that's what entertains. So here we are entertaining by killing. That's the problem. That's why I started a virtual world society. We cannot depend on the industry to do this. We have to take charge of what are the standards, what is the measures of goodness, and what could be done with this technology. So yeah. uh, off my soapbox. <laughs> no, 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 definitely. I, I, I very much agree. I, I published an article in 2017 about what I call V-safety, which is, I feel is the evolution of the E-safety issues that we, we constantly discuss in schools now and, and how those are going to be exacerbated inside virtual worlds. Because not only have you got the issues that you're talking about, Tom, but then you've got things like... Um, the the, the 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 inherent dangers of a, a situation like this the fact that we, we're surrounded by people and they are, don't necessarily need to be who they look like they are and how mm-hmm. impressionable right. uh, you, you mentioned yourself how how power and, and and you know jeremy valenton talked about it as well how powerful this yeah. type of experience is on a child's for a child's brain uh, and i i do think that there will be um increased uh, as as VR becomes more prevalent in in education, there will be increased focus on trying to make sure that it is uh, curtailed and it is is delivered ethically and, and monitored. So, mm-hmm. Tom, just just moving along, the yeah. the first project that I actually got to work on you with was my one. My, so, I, non-profit site virtualteach dot. Uh, I reached a hundred articles in just a year, and I just did kind of. And it, but it that so I reached out to a hundred different from VR in education and uh, asked them for a hundred words. So a hundred words from a hundred. When I when I reached out to Tom, um, that he agreed to contribute uh, what turned out to be probably my my favourite hundred words of the entire project. Um, and I've actually pulled most of Tom's, Tom's contribution out in full. I'm not one for putting a lot of words on slides. And since we were in the other day, Tom, I've, you'll notice I've actually highlighted some of it in yellow. Mm-hmm. Um, there's yellow. Oops. One second. There we go. The bits are yellow. The bit for me, the fact that you refer to education and tra- applications for both touched on already but I in which I've heard you use a couple of times like the idea of like brain ink or indelible mm-hmm. that that is something obviously that's that's come from from that those those decades of of, of work through through the air force into the hit lab and the, and the work that you've done at the rat that's led you to that conclusion and you mentioned just now about uh, the power of VR for retention of information. Um, is, 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 if you wanted to just comment on this at all, then that would be great. And then we'll, what we're going to do is Tom's given us um, some fantastic case studies of education, VR in education that he's he's put together from over the last 20, 25, 30 years that we're going to we're going to rattle through. I'm conscious of time. I know some people may have to to jump out because of other commitments. Um, it's very hard to, to to stop because Tom's stories are, are so fascinating. We're just going to keep going. If you do need to jump out, just be aware that uh, Mike has been recording, and we're actually going to share the engage files after this event. So you'll be able to download the engage files, stick them in the engage folder on your PC, and actually asynchronously rewatch this in full VR. So you'll be able to come back. You'll actually be able to come in and sit on the couch next to Tom if you want. <laughs> That'd be great. So, Tom, is, is there anything you wanted to add about the, the from the, the 100, 100 Voices quote? Well, this is really an encapsulation of what's in my heart and, and what I've been able to see over all these years. Um, and the um, one of the things, uh, and I'll jump a little bit ahead to one of the projects we did, uh, one of my, my very first Ph.D. student at the University of Washington, um, was um, this is on the um, the Garfield High School project, and um, we wanted to find out does um, VR really make a difference? 
and um, from an educational standpoint. So we worked with uh, a, a high school in here in Seattle called Garfield High School, and it's um, the place is really an interesting. At high school, it's sort of like a war zone. You go there, and it looks like <laughs> it looks like a war zone. But they have the most national merit, uh, the greatest number of national merit scholars of of any high school in the city. Um, so um, we talked to the chemistry department and to see if they would cooperate with us, and they agreed to. And uh, we um, uh, asked them, okay, well, we want to try to explore what VR can do in uh, teaching complex subjects. It's actually the uh, it's actually the the um, this, one, this one, yep, this one here, yes. And um, and we asked them, you know, what uh, what is sort of the most difficult thing you have getting across the students? And they said, well, it's it's probably electron orbitals. It's really abstract, and students just don't get it, and don't understand how valence bonds work and things like that. And I said, okay, well, let's 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 try this out. And uh, what we want to do is a, a study where we compare three treatments. One treatment is a traditional blackboard and teacher lecturing and uh, the textbook. And uh, the second treatment is a computer-aided instruction terminal where you can basically uh, look at these kind of uh, arrangements for atoms. And then the, the third is actually a, a virtual world. And you go into this virtual world. That's the image you see on the right. Um, and you basically put together um, an atom. Um, and you uh, you assemble the protons and the neutrons. And uh, and uh, well, well, what happens is when you when you go into the room, you're shrunk down to the size of an atom. And then you take the elementary particles. You take uh, uh, the protons and the neutrons. You put them together to form a nucleus. And then you reach over in another bin and you pull out an electron, you give it a spin and you have a little slider to give it an energy level and then you put it in an orbit. And then you add more protons and neutrons, more electrons, and then eventually you make mo molecules, uh, compounds, things like that. And so uh, we compared uh, students uh, in these three treatments. Uh, 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 it was a uh, between subjects design and we found out uh, they didn't make any difference that they were able to uh, make you know grades. but when we tested them at the end of the module they called up with the smart kids those kids that were the C and D students remembered their chemistry better than the A students. No, what so we were doing an amazing thing of building a model in your head. It's a constructivistic form of education where you are constructing this knowledge, but it isn't in your mind. It's like the difference of what, looking at a brochure or a video of this world. Never forget when the Disney forget so the brochure or the TV program. So the immersiveness unlocks spatial memory, and that helps us remember. The retention is amazing. So this is sort of uh, one of the things that uh, we've found over the period of the many years I've worked on on education, uh, VR and education. So here in uh, uh, in ninety one. Do a uh, as part of their summer academy, they have a sort of like a summer camp for kids. Uh, it's a one week long, uh, over a six week period. They have six groups, one week for each group. We were asked if we would um, uh, give them a VR experience, and um, because VR was just it had been announced that I started the lab in Seattle. They thought, well, this would be really cool, and they had a robotics. Uh, they did this in four days, and. Uh, it's whimsical. It's beautiful. And they had a blast and I never forget it. So <laughs> that told me it's interesting Minecraft came along, right? I, I mean, was just gonna when, mention Minecraft, it, yeah. when Minecraft came along, kids stopped playing computer games. You know, 
they reduced the amount of time they play computer games because they'd rather create. And that's really what all of us ultimately want to do is create instead of tearing down and destroying and things like that. So anyhow, we did this. In, um, oh, go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Well, let's advance a little bit. To, let's go to number uh, three. Yeah, can, I'm just, uh, I'm just conscious three. of time, Tom, because uh, 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 we've been going for an hour now. I, I'm still well, okay. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> Are you still but, okay? Uh, yeah, okay, sure. Cool. Let me just mention a couple other things, then we'll have a question. Question time. What about? Okay? I, I've got to ask you. I've got to ask you. I'm going to skip number three because that's the one with the videos that we had the other day that didn't play. Right. But I've got to ask you about this because this one fascinates me. Oh yeah. The reality ruining vehicle from. Right. Okay. Well, what, uh, what, what did you what did you have in the back of this van? <laughs> well, actually. This was, just a delivery van. It carried the oh, equipment. Right. It carried the equipment to the schools, and so we had two oh, of okay. these. I spent a time driving all over Washington State. Another one that drew uh, was all over Nebraska. Yeah. And this was funded by U.S. West Foundation. And the uh, idea was to show kids what virtual reality was, and to have them a chance, have a good opportunity to experience it as well as to work with individual schools where they build their own virtual worlds. You see 350 kids were involved in various schools building their own virtual worlds. And uh, this was quite a successful program. As a matter of fact, a number of those kids that did this in engineering. So, nice. um, so this was a way to get it out into the to the world uh, because otherwise it's just sort of university-centric and uh, – you know, we don't get out there to where it makes a difference, especially in Nebraska. You know, and yeah. so this was quite a, a an interesting uh, experience. Yeah. Yeah. You want to do three? Okay, let's do three. Uh, Hang on, let me go back one. There we go. It's a throwaway kids. Project. Happened was uh, we'd gotten out in the news, and this this uh, organization in Southwest Seattle approached us and said, "You know, we have we wonder if you could help us with the project. We have uh, 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 these fourteen, fifteen kids that are, are what we call throwaway kids. These are the ones that have been expelled from school for doing drugs or whatever, uh, uh, peddling drugs, and they they have terrible home lives. Um, they're on the streets." We want to occupy them, give them something to do, because uh, they're going to cause trouble. And uh, would you help us? And I thought, gosh, we're not in that kind of business. I mean, we're, we're in the business of developing, educa- developing technology, educating students and things like that. But anyhow, they beat me into submission, and uh, I agreed to do this. And we said, okay, well, what uh, what went on here? And they said, well, uh, we just want to keep them alive for one more year. That's our metric. If these 14 kids are alive one year from now, then we will have succeeded. What can you do to help us? And I said, well, what is your needs? Of course, they're shooting up drugs and they're promiscuous and all that kind of thing. And so I said, okay, um, uh, maybe we could build a simulation of how the AIDS virus works, and they can play in this simulation. And we thought about that for a while, and I said, nah, let's him to do it. So here we had this um, this group of kids, and um, they uh, show up at the lab. First kiss I had before. I was terrified. They're 14 years old, but I was afraid of them. And these are rough, pretty rough kids. And we said, okay, <laughs> what we're going to do is build this for the world having to do with AIDS and HIV and how that works. And oh, by the way, here's, here's a, some doctors you can talk to. Here are, here's a library. Here's some libraries you can go to. And here are some people who have AIDS you can talk to. You have at it. So again, we took the computers down to where they were going to meet, and um, it was unbelievable what they did. What they did was build 
a simulation of a T4 cell. They figure this out all on their own. Where you go into this world where you become a T4 cell and then you're being attacked. And, um, and what happens is it bleeds you of your energy. And the only way that you can recover your energy is to go to these charging stations, which are in this world. And you have to be really focused on that because if you don't go to these charging stations, they're going to bleed you of your energy. And by the way, when you have your all your energy gone, you can't move anymore. So this is quite a revelation that when you're dead, you don't move anymore. And uh, they they built this, and the charging stations were the first charging station was. The second charging station was bleed to clean needles. Yeah. The third charging station was condoms. The fourth charging station was a zipped up pair of pants. And, and you start moving around to get to these places to charge up while you're being attacked. And then they said, well, uh, we, uh, we're wondering, uh, we've written this rap song to go with playing the game. So they played us this rap song now. And so you go into the world, this rap song is going on. They said, I wonder if we can borrow some cameras and make a movie of this, of our playing the virtual world, uh, the AIDS world. We said, okay. And they did. And they made this movie with a rap song and they're going in the world, things like that. And they said, can we take it to the schools to show the kids what AIDS is about? <laughs> And I couldn't believe it that um, the city actually let them do it. So these kids, these 14-year-old kids, these are 14-year-old, 14 of them, show up in a schoolroom. And let me tell you, those kids in the class sit up straight and listen to what they're saying because they're street kids. They really know what they're talking about. And they show the video. And was hired by the city as an AIDS counselor. Had they had any success with this program? But every day, every one of those kids were there building that world. Every day. There was nothing wrong with those kids. They're brilliant. They just had terrible home lives. They didn't have any yeah. role models and things like that. So it wasn't really VR as much as giving them something to do, but it was so us, compelling. Yeah. It was, uh, you know. So anyhow, that's the um, that's the case Throw. study. Throw I'm really kids. glad. I'm, I'm really glad we went back to that one. To be honest, Tom, mm -hmm. uh, we the, there's the video clips here, but we're we're having trouble playing these video clips with into an engage. Just these no, ones. Don't worry. Um, maybe I'll, I'll tweet them out on the hashtag later on if I can uh, if I can extract them from the slide deck. Um, but Tom, uh, again, I, I'm a little bit conscious of time, but let, let's just mm -hmm. jump forwards. I'm going to skip past number five. Yeah, that's a fun one too, but we you, can skip it. I know, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> They're all, this is the thing. This should have been part one of a series, I think, rather than just one great big long session. <laughs> um, this one was interesting. We were talking about this the other day. That, that the uh, I liked the fact that this... Uh, work within the virtual world led on to the to the real world activity with the ship with the boat yeah well i mean the the original idea here was how do you teach complexity this is funded by a national science foundation it's about a three million dollar grant where we looked at how do you teach complexity using vr and um, uh, one of the things that became important is not just learning about things, but can you synthesize? Can you take that and apply it? And one of the exercises we had for these kids, so what we what we did was we got various departments together to university, atmospheric science, the fisheries, the hydrology people, oceanography, uh, uh, all of these people who take their models and combine them into a really complex uh, model that we created, uh, that we then represented in a virtual world, where you could do some things. Like in Puget Sound, with the water flow, we could um, actually put virtual dye 
in the water at various levels and see how it moves around and things like that and uh, temperature, salinity, all those kinds of things, really complex. And then what we had the kids do was the, the city was contemplating putting in a new sewage treatment plant and didn't know where to put it. Mm-hmm. And so these sixth graders, these sixth graders told the city fathers where to put a sewage treatment plant based upon all these dynamics of what were going on, including the fish. But the next slide is where they had this model and they were doing various tests in the model. If you do the next slide, yeah. uh, this is where we actually had them out in the research ship, the Thompson, where they were checking their data to make sure it was correct. So this is where they did some synthesis in virtual space and then went out and tested in the real space. Amazing. The last one that we've got on here is the, is the more uh, recent example. This is from just uh, the last year, uh, 2017 into 2018, mm-hmm. uh, the Robert Eagle uh, Middle School. Um, right. We've got a video. Uh, you've, set, you, you've given me a video clip to play for this one, Tom. Did you want to talk about it first? Or could I show Let me just say a couple of things. Um, we, sure. uh, this, this middle school, Robert Eagle Staff Middle School, is on tribal land. It's Muckleshoot land in Seattle. And um, this was a, uh, a new school, brand new school, uh, that um, uh, had the kids from 6th to 8th grade, uh, about uh, 800 of them. And um, we were approached by the principal to say, can we put VR in the school? And uh, we said, well, yeah, this could, we'd be happy to think about that. This is Virtual World Society that would, would be um, doing that and uh, working with them. And uh, we got HTC and Intel to help us with it. And we started, let's start off with just an after school program to see how the kids will react to it. So here you see the, the school and then also some of the students that are actually in the process of authoring one of the virtual worlds. And we had a number of groups and the whole idea was to use for the kids to teach, to, to, to generate some content that would teach them subjects. These are sixth graders primary, primarily to teach uh, other sixth graders as STEM subjects. So again, this is an after school program, uh, uh, last year and, um, this is a little video that we made of that uh, experience. And this is similar to videos, the other videos you've seen, but these are fun kids. I'll go ahead. Yeah, it's a great clip. And I, I, you always know when kids are super, super engaged using virtual reality when they're on the floor. I get this all the time <laughs> with the kids that I work with. Suddenly you turn around and someone's crouched on the floor drawing their tilt mm-hmm. brush drawing. And you know that's mm-hmm. it. That they're, they're, they're in a whole other world right now. So here we go. Right. Today is start going over just some of the basics, how to add objects, how to manipulate them. some worlds? Yes. All right.
be worth it's a lot It's a price! Of Channel of Donut Land! It's, it's <gasps> Activity levels like if you want to be a, an engineer, you can practice doing that. Teeny oh, yeah. you know, even you know, like, with, like sunglasses, I'd even say it almost be like contacts or something. Yeah, that are like this like little yeah. tiny contact lens that you can just pop into your eyes. You are. She's probably not wrong. <laughs> That's right. I'm amazed at the insight that these kids have. Um, yeah. Now, this year, um, because of the success of the program last year, we are actually in the classroom. Um, so in four periods during uh, the day, we have about a total of about 105 kids that are in this school that are taking this this particular part of the sequence as a module in a STEM sequence. So we're actually in the classroom now, and we want to use that as a model. We learned a lot. It's an archetype of how we can now uh, transport that and get that into other schools. Absolutely amazing, Tom. We're, we're going to move on to some Q&A now, but just before we do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute everybody and we're going to give Tom an absolutely massive round of applause or hoop and holler, depending on whether you're holding your hand. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right, I'm going to mute everybody then. <laughs> we got some feedback. Uh, Tom, Tom, let me just unmute you. Um, guys in the audience, if you've got a question for Tom and you're on a VR headset and you can throw your hand in the air, then uh, do let me know and I will unmute you. Mike and Chris, I will unmute you. Chris Long, are you still here? I am indeed. <laughs> Chris, you, you can help me out here in case people have got their hands up and I can't see the names. <coughs> right. Has anybody got a question for Tom? Maybe that we... Oh, over the back there. Is that Andrew? Andrew. Oh, Andrew, you're unmuted. You, you've muted yourself, Andrew. <laughs> Oh, okay, my God. Here we go. Um, have yes. you done anything with the social, any of the social VR platforms like High Fidelity or Sansar in creating classes there um, for kids and stuff where everything's there? They could put on in the future a quest or something and go there uh, versus building everything yourself. Well, certainly, um, no, we have not. Uh, to answer your question, um, we uh, will certainly, but the uh, we don't we don't want to build things ourselves uh, mm -hmm. as much. Uh, we want them to, but uh, our experience has been that um, it's very difficult to teach them at this age, especially sixth, seventh, seventh grade, uh, unity. Um, unity was a, a real problem. I mean, we were, we were doing Playmaker and, and, um, because it's way over their heads, uh, they can use, uh, Google Box, they can use, uh, um, uh, Tilt Brush, things like that, of course. But, um, the tools that we might find in some of the social platforms may work out a little bit better, but we have not gone there yet. And, uh, it's really a good suggestion. Thank you. And, and also, I mean, engage as well. I mean, this is stunning, you mm -hmm. know, what's created here. But it that, is. that's what I mean, is engage and some of the ones that are already there. Go ahead, Steve. Good save, mm -hmm. Andrew. Good save. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, Andrew, I'm going to, uh, well, if you could just read me yourself. Is there anybody else a question for Tom? Uh, front of you, Tyler. One second, Tyler. 
No, oh, Rupert. I, I, I happen to. Sorry, Tyler. I happen to have Rupert right in front of me. So I'm going to unmute Rupert and then find you. Rupert, you're unmuted. Oh, okay. Rupert, we can you. Tyler, I've unmuted you, but you, you've got yourself self-muted. You just need to unmute yourself. All right. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so amazing. Like, I would say this has been a life-changing session almost. Um, but Tom, Tom, what I want to go back to is when you were talking about the demo you did of the, uh, you know, the car chase. And you were talking about how, you know, the content that the industry is creating versus the content that these kids are creating. Um, so to, to kind of preface this, so I'm I'm working um, in a college where we're we're now training the next generation of content developers. We're we're you know working with these students to say you know like this this virtual reality has so much potential you know go and create. Um, how do you know how do we go about encouraging them to um, you know take on endeavors where they're not you know trying to recreate these destructive environments, but um, I, I guess in a way, how do we encourage them to create things that are that are entertaining that aren't destructive? You still with us, Tom? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Testing. Okay. Uh, it's all good. I, I muted you because we were getting a bit of a feedback loop through, okay. going through you for a moment there, but you seem clear okay. again now. Okay. Did you hear Tyler's question? Uh, Rupert, we're talking about Rupert's question. Oh, it was Tyler, actually. It was Tyler over here. Oh, it's Tyler. Sorry, <clears throat> not Rupert. Tyler. Okay, I look over at Tyler now. <clears throat> the um, Tyler, the um, I think the uh, the first thing, of course, is you give them an objective of something that you're trying to uh, what their what the purpose of the world is. What is the what are the learning objectives? Things like that. And then uh, for them to explore from using that as the foundation or the launching point to dis, uh, explore different ways of doing it. Now, there will be a, an, um, uh, a tendency, especially amongst uh, some of the males, it seems like, to want to um, put in some shooting things we had in our our um kids uh they wanted to punch things i think there was one thing where you're punching a a serpent um in one of the worlds um you can uh again uh, let them explore that but hopefully it'll be self-limiting it's not that you want to put constraints on them you want them to, to develop their own constraints um that are uh, what is the uh, what are practices best practice practices of goodness teach the best now that doesn't mean they don't become active and don't uh, interact of course in a in some ways like uh, shooting cannons and and uh, uh, punching dragons but um, uh, still I think the more you can responsibility you can put into the students to regulate that based upon the learning objectives and what comes out of it you want it to be fun. You don't want to take away the fun part, but there are ways to, to have fun without necessarily harming anything. And so it's back to the principles of robotics, you know, that do no harm and do no harm necessarily to virtual things as well as real things. I don't know if that's helpful. Fantastic. Uh, uh, Chris, is Rupert still there? Is Rupert? Can you, can you hear me now? I yeah, can, Rupert. Really How are you? Hey, great. Good, good. 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 Uh, really enjoyed that. Thank you so much, Tom. That was a really inspirational. Uh, I've got just two things. One's a comment on what Andrew said. Um, uh, co-spaces is a really good thing to look at, made by uh -huh. a really great German company. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very creative, mm -hmm. perfectly suited for kind of K6 and up. Uh, and uh, uh, again, like you say, uh, a step down from kind of the requirements of unity. So I, I really recommend Ooh. that uh, to to, um, to schools. I was literally just using that with some year sevens yesterday, Rupert, and 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 telling it to them as this is the stepping stone towards unity, and unity is what the game right. you, you play exactly. is made on. 
exactly. That's right. Uh, and, and my actual my actual question on on um, uh, and that is that Tom, you've you've been decades ahead of us. You know, we're just catching up now to uh, to you know where you were forty years ago uh, in virtual reality. Uh, what should we be? What should our eye be on forty years from now? You know, where's it going? You kind of you've been waiting for us to get here. Now where are you? Um, the uh, it w used to be clear where we were going to go, needed to go. Um, uh, for example, um, we, we there were clear challenges with the hardware, and we knew we had to increase update rate, we had to increase resolution, we had to increase field of view, those kinds of things. Those are very clear objectives. Now it's not necessarily as clear, especially since we're switching over from concentrating on the delivery mechanism to concentrating on the content, uh, the experience you're going to have. Because you can have the best TV in the world, but if you're limited in what the program content is, it's not going to do much good. So content will be keen, and I think everybody will sort of agree with that once we have the fundamental problem solved with the hardware technology. So um, where, where, what is our next? Where do we see? Well, it's clear to me that if content is king, then we need much better tools to develop content. We're still using CAD tools. We're using two-dimensional tools to develop three-dimensional content. We're just beginning to find that we can create 3D within 3D. We can create three-dimensional worlds while we're in virtual reality. So I think that that uh, we should concentrate right now on developing those content generation tools so that artists, storytellers, um, people who are not com uh, computer scientists um, or whatever, uh, have to, uh, that, that they can be used. That people who uh, have uh, traditionally been the creators of these kinds of things, of, the, of this content. So that's one big thing. The second big thing is how do we tightly couple and use the um, the future of um, of artificial intelligence in the next forty years? Um, the uh, the one of the uh, tent inference engine. Uh, this was our piece of AI. It's like R two D two. That was uh, in the cockpit with us, and R two D two would sort of watch what we're doing, and make inferences of what we're trying to accomplish, and would go out there and collect things to help us. And certainly, if we're doing uh, explorations, if we're doing for uh, uh, content building, uh, and these uh, inferences can be made, then we can have our bots go out and help us. And so now we have this association with artificial intelligence, sort of a companion that helps us uh, with this content generation or with problem solving. So it's AI is going to be upon us. And, um, and so we'll certainly want to connect with real people, but we'll also want to connect with uh, our uh, artificial intelligence entities as well. Well, cool. Thank yeah. you, Rupert. Uh, any more questions for Tom, or shall we? Oh, Tyler again. You, you've got yourself so muted. You're welcome to ask another question. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Steve. I'm sorry. I just, you know, got you in the room. <laughs> Might as well ask the question. So I'm giving a presentation at uh, a school district tomorrow, and the title of the presentation is The Future of Media is Spatial. How would you respond to that assertion? Well, the whole idea is how do we awaken the um, the capacity of the human? How do we awaken the brain to, to will help us to uh, uh, not only students understand but retain? And uh, certainly, that's what VR does better than any other medium that we have. Uh, it, it certainly doesn't take the place of the real world, but certainly you can do things in VR you can't do in the real world. You can walk at the speed of light. You can shrink yourself to the size of a um, 
um, one millimeter. You can um, do these various things that are impossible to do in the real world, but give you incredible insights. Well, the uh, let me tell you a little story, if you don't mind. Um, I was uh, contacted by a group of fourth graders um, uh, not long after I'd come to the university, and um, uh, they called me and said, "We wonder if you'd come up to our school and talk to us about virtual reality." And uh, I, I said, "Well, sure, I'd be happy to come." So they invited me up, and I um, was uh, in the um, in the in the cafeteria. This is at their lunch period, a big round table with boys and girls, and they uh, were looking. Uh, 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 expectantly to me and they said well we're glad you came because we're going to talk to you about virtual reality i said great i'm glad to be here and they said we think there should be virtual frogs (laughs) and i said virtual frogs uh okay what about virtual frogs and they said well you see we're really concerned about all those students around uh the country who are in the ninth and 10th grades who are dissecting real frogs to see what's inside of them. And so they're having to kill frogs to to basically get educated about frogs. And if they're virtual frogs, you wouldn't have to kill the real frogs. You could just dissect these virtual frogs. And oh, by the way, you could actually shrink yourself to one inch high and get a frog's eye view of the world, what that looks like. Or you could then shrink yourself to one millimeter high and you can crawl up a frog and go into the mouth and go down the esophagus into the stomach and come out at the other end. Mm-hmm. About this time, I'm thinking, gosh, these guys are better than my grad students. And um, I realized that uh, that t- these kids were, you know, were thinking about this. And I said, well, you can, yeah, you can do that. You'll be able to do all that. But I said, you know, who's going to, you got to create these models. You have to create this content. Who's going to do that? And one of the fourth graders across the table looked at me indignantly and pointed to him. And he said, he said, well, we are. We're the only ones that have any imagination. <laughs> so it, the whole idea is about imagination. And the spatial piece of this the spatial communication provided by VR media awakens that, and um, because the first thing you do when you're in fi- when you're talking about fighter pilots, fighter pilots are talking to each about other about what a particular mission was, and things like that. The first thing they do is hold up their hands, and they move their hands around and said, "Well, I was here," and mm-hmm. this the guy was, and what you're trying to do is draw a picture for a person to understand what's happening. And so we communicate so many things uh, spatially, spatially, and this gives us opportunity to do that. Well, good luck with your presentation. It's like, Tom, it's the obvious one, isn't it? I caught a fish. It was this big. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I was this big. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's it interesting you that you mentioned other – go on. I said you don't use you don't use words as much. You, you said, well, it's a, you know, 12 inches. It was 12, about 14 inches. You're holding yeah, your hands up. Yeah. He was about yeah. yay big. <laughs> it's interesting yeah. that you mentioned about the frogs because we've just seen uh, Victory VR win the, the VDA awards from Vive for their frog dissection experience. And actually, mm-hmm. my my six year old daughter, who um, she uses my, my, she doesn't use my Vive, she uses the Acer mixed reality headset. And she asked me the other day, she said, I want, I want to play something new, Dad. I want to play something new. So I said, Well, I've got this frog one. Do you want to try that? She was transfixed and she, she, she went through the entire thing. She wasn't squeamish at all. She was, she did the whole thing, took all the organs out, was fascinated. She said, look how small the heart is. Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. Look how small the heart is. And I was going, oh yeah, great. The next day she said, what can I dissect next? So I think she's <laughs> either going to be a vet. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> either way. <laughs> Right, guys, well, you know, I th- we, we, I think we are going to draw an end here because it, it has been one of the... Oh, yeah. It's hard to stop. <laughs> well, let me mention one last thing. You're I more than welcome that, to keep uh, going, Tom. I'm, just, I'm well, conscious that I'm taking up your time. Sure. <laughs> and I think we as a civilization are at childhood's end. We have to grow up. 
and we have to be mindful of our environment of of the earth and of each other and how is that going to, how are we going to do that well we have all this power all this technology and really what's this back to the navigation thing what's going to how what's going to chart our course in the future i think it has to be our hearts our hearts will tell us what we need to be doing and it's got to transcend you know just economy capitalism or whatever our hearts will tell us and we have suffering humanity out in the world and i believe that we have the tools to help solve those problems and that's where our children can help the hearts of children they understand these things they have the empathy and i think the children can lead us and help us to know where to go in a lot of these things and that should be part of our navigation system of the future is to listen to the children and to also listen to our own hearts and use that to guide us. Amazing. To, to, Tom, I, I said at the start, and I, I say it again, it's, it's been like sitting here with Obi-Wan Kenobi. I, 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 am, I am in absolute awe of, of your career, of your, your passion, of your drive, and, and of what you've, what you've tried over the last... 50 years to achieve with this technology and, and I know that there's a lot of people myself included here in the room that are, are now trying to, to pick the ball up and run with it as best we can and 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 to to, to, to to be able to learn from you today was was incredibly powerful and I can't thank you enough for giving up your time so thank you so so much thank you it's been wonderful it's been fun thanks everyone right <laughs> Woo! Yeah. <laughs>